everyone. Welcome to the second to last session of the day. My name is Maya and I am a third year undergraduate student at Yale University. And I am so excited to join you here today to introduce our next speaker, Lawrence Lessig. Mr. Lessig is the Roy L. Furnham Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School and the former director of Harvard University's Center for Ethics. In his early career, Lessig clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia on the United States Supreme Court. He has also served as a professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School and Stanford Law School. Lessig is one of the leading contemporary minds on intellectual property and institutional corruption. Today, under the Global Justice Conference's theme of structural change, Lessig is going to be talking about representative democracy and the movement towards a novel Article V Constitutional Convention in the United States. After his lecture, I will open the floor to questions from our audience. As a courtesy reminder to anyone who is now just joining this call, um, this is a Zoom call, so please make sure that your microphone is muted until it is time to ask questions. With that, I am so excited to open the floor to one of my biggest inspirations, Lawrence Lessig. Thank you, uh, Maya, and um, <clears throat> I'm grateful for the chance to talk. Um, so thanks. I'm going to I'm going to make a, a short presentation. I hope it's about 20 minutes at most, and uh, because I'm very eager to have a conversation about what, among my sorts, people on the left in America, is a kind of scandalous idea. So I want to be openly scandalous and embrace um, its potential. Um, and so. In presenting this idea, I'm going to make two assumptions, and I'm going to invoke the law professor's privilege of saying you're not allowed to fight the assumptions, you have to just embrace them. Um, because the analysis is contingent on the assumptions. If you don't believe the assumptions are true, then you don't have to worry about the analysis. Um, okay, so assumption number one. The United States Constitution, <clears throat> however much we speak of it in high regarding terms uh, must be amended. It is deeply flawed, deeply unjust, uh, and broken in its defense of democratic norms. And if one recognizes this, then the only question is how we might amend the Constitution. Article 5 of the Constitution governs how it can be amended. That article outlines two ways that amendments might be proposed. One way, the only way that's ever been invoked is that two thirds of Congress could propose an amendment, which then has to be ratified by three fourths of the states, either state legislatures or state conventions. But a second mode of amending is that two thirds of the states call on Congress to convene a convention. And the convention's purpose or function expressly in the Constitution is simply to propose amendments which again must be ratified by three fourths of the states, either states conventions or state legislatures. So for example, one of the most important reform organizations in America right now, American Promise, has been pushing their For Our Freedom Amendment, which is a really critically important set of changes to address the democratic deficit um, that has developed inside of the American Republic. Um, they're very proud to report that there are 22 states across the country which have either through legislative action or initiative campaigns ratified in the sense of expressing support for their amendment. But when American Promise thinks about the amendment, it wants the amendment to be ratified after Congress has proposed it. So two thirds of Congress has to propose it, which means it needs 67 senators and 290 representatives. Well, let's think a little bit practically about 67 senators. In the current Congress, that would mean it would need 17 Republican senators. Now, American Promise has been doing its work, its great work since 2016. You might ask how many Republican senators have signed up for the American Promise Amendment or co-sponsored the American Promise Amendment? And the answer is exactly zero. Um, and so the idea of two thirds of Congress proposing that amendment, at least in the immediate term, seems quite remote. Which leads some to say, why don't we think about the second path for proposing an amendment, two thirds of the states calling for a convention. 
And American Promise's response to that is just no. Um, they're not at all encouraging of the idea of a convention. And when you say why, my sense is that that's primarily a product of what we refer to as FUD, the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and distrust. And this FUD comes from both the right and the left. It was born in the 1960s when the John Birch Society, especially Phyllis Schlafly, insisted that a convention would march us towards Stalinist repression. But now the, the fear is driven mainly on the left by groups like Common Cause and my friend and in many respects hero, uh, Robert Reich. I'm gonna play a brief video of Robert Reich trashing the idea of a convention. The biggest threat to our democracy that nobody's talking about is the real possibility of a rogue constitutional convention empowering extremists to radically reshape the Constitution, our laws, and our country. If just a few more states sign on to what's called an Article 5 Convention for a balanced budget amendment, there's no limit to the damage they might do. Now, let me explain. There are two ways to amend the United States Constitution. One way, the way we've passed every amendment since the Bill of Rights, is for two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate to vote for a proposed amendment and then have it ratified by at least three quarters of the states, now 38 in number. But there's a second way to amend the Constitution. Two thirds of the states may demand Congress form a constitutional convention to propose amendments. Once a constitutional convention is convened, there are no rules to limit or constrain what comes next. Amendments proposed by an Article 5 convention are supposed to be ratified by 38 states but convention delegates could hijack the process and change the ratification process itself, tossing out the 38 state requirement. A balanced budget amendment would be crazy enough, but nothing would be safe. A woman's right to choose, marriage equality, First Amendment protections for free speech and free press, equal protection of the laws, checks and balances. The worst case scenario, is an Article 5 convention would allow delegates to write their agenda into our Constitution. This would be chaos. Already, 28 states have called for a constitutional convention. They only need six more to succeed. Unlimited money in politics and partisan gerrymandering have already given Republicans control of a majority of state legislatures. Big money interests like the Koch brothers and ALEC are investing heavily in the push for a constitutional convention, which means that they'd be calling the shots if one takes place. Now, I understand you're probably already overwhelmed with political actions you need to take, but believe me, this is important. With just a few states to go, your voice is needed. These are the states that could vote for a constitutional convention. If you're in one of them, please tell your state lawmakers to reject calls for an Article 5 convention. <clears throat> Thank you for watching. So there's plenty in that presentation that I would argue strongly against as a factual matter. But if that presentation represents the push, especially on the left, to block a convention, what we should recognize is what that means is that there are not going to be amendments to our Constitution, which means if there are no amendments to this Constitution, then this broken Constitution remains broken and its inability to address critical issues of justice um, in America will remain. OK, so that was the first assumption I wanted you to start with, the idea that uh, we need changes in the Constitution. <clears throat> Here's the second. There is going to be an Article 5 convention. I asked uh, Dali to paint liberals' reactions to that. That's Dali's characterization of liberal reaction to that. But there is going to be a convention. Already, the balanced budget convention, uh, this is updating Robert's, uh, Bob's numbers a bit. Um, there are 27 calls for a balanced budget convention. But there are four plenary calls, meaning calls that are not related to a particular uh, issue, which means there are 31 active calls out of 34. And the movement, the right wing movement to get a convention has, by my estimates, about a billion dollars stashed away 
to push for a convention. And some, including Scott Walker, former governor of Wisconsin, who's become a powerful uh, advocate for the idea of a convention, believes that if you count the applications properly, which is not simple because they don't come in a standard form, they're very complex to interpret, he believes there are already enough to call a convention, meaning already enough for Congress to have the authority to call a convention. And when you recognize that it is quite possible that the Republicans will achieve a trifecta in the next election, the Senate is um, extremely vulnerable, the House is right now Republican, and the last um, prediction market numbers on the presidency found 70% chance of Donald Trump being reelected. What that means is that the trifecta would, uh, would create an enormous probability that the right would move on a convention. But whether or not it happens in the next cycle, if not now, I think we need to recognize, or at least the hypothetical that I'm setting up assumes that we're gonna see something like a maturing convention call soon. Okay, that's the second of these two assumptions. Um, and here's the argument that's gonna follow from that brace of assumptions. This reality leads us to ask, especially on the left, what could be done to stop the convention? That's what Bob Reich and Common Cause have been arguing strongly for. They have led state legislatures that have made the call for the convention to address the money and politics problem, withdraw their call so that there is now basically only calls for right-wing conventions. My assumption is that this effort to stop the convention is gonna fail ex ante. There will be a march to a convention, but there's a question of what we could do in a sense ex post, what we could do to render useless the convention call, um, or at least render it useless in its current frame to create an incentive for a different kind of convention to be convened. And the insight that leads to the strategy I'm gonna describe is if it takes 38 states to ratify any amendment, which under the rules of the constitution it does, despite Bob Reich's suggestion those rules could be changed, then 13 states can stop any amendment. So let's first imagine 13 states today passing a, uh, a resolution that said, we, the Commonwealth or state of whatever, preemptively reject any amendment proposed by an Article V convention. So that, if passed by 13 states, would be a way of saying, even if there's a convention, anything that comes out of it is hereby rejected. Now, my suggestion is that that effort at uh, a veto of the convention movement would have a very slight effect. Um, I don't think it would slow the push for a convention. It might in fact accelerate it as it emphasized the sense in which um, this vetoing tactic had nothing more than its own partisan view in sight. So this response might be a sensible additional response to the efforts to try to stop states from voting for a convention, but it doesn't solve what was the first of the two assumptions that I thought important to put before you, which is we need changes to the Constitution, and this is not a way to get more changes to the Constitution. So that leads to a second suggestion. What if we had uh, a preemptive resolution that says we, the Commonwealth or state of whatever, preemptively reject any amendment proposed by a right-wing convention, meaning a convention that is called and limited to only issues that are viewed to be on the right. So for example, the balanced budget amendment, though many on the left support that um, is viewed as a right-wing amendment. Many of the amendments proposed by the Convention of the States project um, are viewed as right-wing uh, amendments because they are all about shrinking the size of the federal government. And this would say as you can't have a convention that only considers one side of proposed changes to the constitution. It must be open to both sides. Um, and I suggest that would in fact have a better effect in the sense of it would be a constructive resistance to the convention movement, constructive for the sense, for the objective of trying to open up the idea of a convention 
to the concerns of Americans more broadly. Um, so this incentive for cross-partisanship would be a valuable contribution to the existing convention debate. Okay, but I think there's an even better idea, a better way to render an Article 5 convention democratically legitimate. Uh, and here's how that could be done. I, many, of course, are familiar with the extraordinary innovation that's happening across the world around citizen assemblies. That translated into American English would be better called citizen juries because of our because our constitution expressly embeds the power of juries both to uh, indict and also to convict of federal crimes. But these citizen assemblies or citizen juries are thought of as random representative bodies that gather and meet face to face. They are informed about the issue they are to be deliberating on and then they deliberate on that issue in a way to come to some resolution or determination about the question presented. Some of the most famous examples of this was the process that led to the drafting of the constitution in Iceland, which started with a national forum of representative random selection of people to identify the issues the constitution was to address. And then there was an election to select people to draft that constitution and a beautiful constitution came out of that process, which was then set to ratification um, in the uh, it, through referendum, more than two thirds of those voting supported it, but the parliament then promptly just forgot it, which was extraordinary, but doesn't diminish the significance of the citizen assembly movement. Even more successful have been the Irish citizen assemblies, which have met to address a wide range of issues, but maybe mo most interestingly issues like um, same-sex marriage and abortion rights, which the citizen assemblies considered and in both contexts uh, pushed for liberalization to include same-sex marriage and to decriminalize the abortion um, procedures. Um, those were two results which, of course, it would have been impossible to imagine the Irish parliament proposing, but though the citizen assembly proposed it and ratified it uh, itself by more than 60% uh, votes, it then went to the public, which ratified it by an even stronger majority. But I think the most interesting, maybe coolest example, one not spoken of, I think, enough, um, comes from this place. This is Mongolia. It's a picture, not a painting. Um, and this is, in uh, John Adams' sense of the word, a picture of Mongolia, in the sense of this is a perfectly representative, uh, it's a little bit more women than it should be, but that's probably not a problem, but um, representative sample of Mongolia, both across income, sex, geography. Um, and these are people who, because Mongolia is a country the size of Western Europe with a population of 3 million, um, had traveled you know, two nights in a bus to come to Ulaanbaatar to participate in deliberative assembly around proposed amendments to the constitution because the Mongolian constitution has a rule that says that it cannot the parliament cannot consider an amendment until it has been considered by a deliberative assembly in the context of um, this deliberative poll. So these examples led to the idea, lead to the idea that I want to propose as a modification to the uh, process of amending through convention. And the idea is to basically use citizen juries to render an Article 5 convention safe, meaning safe in a majoritarian democracy sense of safe. And there are two steps to make that possible. The first step is to recognize what the core fear behind the convention of, uh, of the convention movement is. And the fear is that the convention would be governed by crazies or extremists or the most polarizing people in our political society. Since in principle, you could have a convention that would be, de delegates would be selected by rules the um, state legislatures select, and the state legislatures are the least representative, representative bodies in America today. And they could select delegates were the who are the most extreme, and then they could have a process that was then proposing an amendment to be ratified by state legislatures. So the most polarizing and extreme politicians in America would be amending the constitution without any guarantee of majoritarian check. So um, the Convention of the States, which is a project that was started by a former Tea Party um, Patriots founder, 
Um, one of the leaders uh, put it like this, if you put enough pressure on state legislatures, you can get stuff done. You don't need a majority of America because the majority doesn't participate. In state legislative matters, less than 1% of the people ever participate. With 1% of the American public, that's 3 million people, I can guarantee we can get this done. And so talk like that leads to this fear that any convention would lack democratic legitimacy. But I want to claim that I personally fixed this problem. By losing a Supreme Court case, I fixed this problem. Um, in 2021, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, in 2020, um, brought a case to the United States Supreme Court that asked the question whether presidential electors in the Electoral College could be directed by the state legislatures on how they must vote. Um, state le some state legislatures had a rule that say, said that the electors had to vote the way the people had voted. And the question is whether electors had a constitutional discretion to vote in a different way. Um, now, I thought, looking at the history and the founding conception of the Electoral College, that it was pretty obvious that state legislatures didn't have that power, that they couldn't control how electors cast their ballot. The very word elector implies a choice. And the only other time the Constitution speaks of an elector is when they talk about voters, referred to as electors. Nobody would imagine the state of Massachusetts could pass a law that says everyone voting in Massachusetts has to vote Democratic. So it seemed odd to imagine that they could pass a law that directs how electors must vote. So though it was obvious to me, however, the United States Supreme Court 9 to 0 said it's obviously yes that electors can be directed by state legislatures in how they vote and directed in a very powerful sense in that a state legislature could say, this is how an elector must vote. And if the elector doesn't vote that way, there can be a procedure to automatically remove that elector and replace them with an elector that votes in the way the legislature directs. Now, the silver lining of this decision, in my view, is that because of this case, that means that we could control delegates at an Article 5 convention legally. If presidential electors are controllable, the delegates to a, um, a convention then are certainly controllable because presidential electors at least have a constitutional status. They're mentioned in the constitution. Delegates to a convention are subservient to that. And so you could imagine a law directly telling the electors in the uh, delegates to an Article V convention precisely how they must vote. Okay, so take that idea and imagine the following. Imagine a state like Massachusetts passed a law. The law number one convened a citizen assembly, or more better, better described a citizen jury. <clears throat> that citizen jury would be random, representative, large, and mandatory. You, just like jury duty, you have to show up, have to be appropriate compensation and support, of course, but it's conceivable we could make something like that function. Then that jury reviews any prominent amendment proposal that is then being considered in America. So things like the balanced budget amendment, the efforts to regulate money in politics, these are all amendment proposals that have considerable movements behind them right now. That process would include deliberation in the citizen assembly or citizen jury on whether to approve that amendment proposal or not. And then imagine the law that creates the citizen jury declares that no delegate to an Article V convention is permitted to support any proposed amendment unless 60% of that citizen assembly has approved that amendment. So a very sharp democratic constraint on the freedom of the delegate to vote for an amendment. So in this sense, it's a bingo on the idea of achieving democratic control, we've got a convention which is legally controllable to the judgments of a citizen assembly. Okay, now you might say, well, that's just one state. What's that gonna do for the problem of conventions generally? Well, and then that leads to step two, which leverages a bit off of the earlier preemptive resolutions that I described. Because now imagine 13 states say, we, the Commonwealth or state of X, preemptively reject <clears throat> any amendment proposed by the vote of delegates who are not democratically accountable, where democratic accountability means either through a citizen assembly like structure or it could be through a referendum. I don't think it's 
helpful to be very specific about that directly, but, but we could imagine various versions of democratic accountability that would constrain how the delegates could vote. And so that would say, if your convention isn't democratically accountable in this sense, then anything it produces is presumptively rejected or stillborn in the amendment process. This would be leveraging a minority veto to produce a democratically constrained convention. Uh, and if 13 states did that, it would create enormous pressure on the balance of the states who cared about a convention to actually constitute democratic constraints to assure that the convention um, was uh, accountable in this democratic sense. That's bingo number two, because it would get us a democratically safe convention using citizen assemblies to constrain uh, what the convention does. And going back to the first assumption that drives this presentation, it would also get us an amendable constitution, a democratically responsible and responsive and amendable constitution. Okay, so that's the idea. Eager to hear your reactions or explain parts that are missing in that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Larry. That was an excellent and really engaging lesson. I will now open the floor to questions. If you have a question, you can feel free to either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat and I can read it. Can I ask uh, how does it look in the moment? Uh, how far are we with the 13 states uh, in well, implementing right. the strategy? We don't have any state that's adopted the resolution. We have some states we're beginning to talk about it. Um, in, in Vermont and in uh, Massachusetts, we've begun to talk about it. Um, uh, but it's not moving as quickly as the movement to amend the Constitution. I think if we see uh, the men to call it convention, I think if we see a trifecta in this next election, the urgency is going to become more obvious to people because they'll see that we have a Congress that could convene a convention, simple majority vote, um, and uh, and that will push us to think about what we should do in response. Mm -hmm. And do you have a list of sort of 13 prime candidates? I mean, it's easy to identify the, the candidates that are most likely to unify around it. Um, I don't, you know, we don't have the infrastructure right now to put together the campaign mm -hmm. to do that. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to stand up a campaign that just thought of its job as number one, producing the 13 um, in a uh, in a resolution, and then number two, standing up the infrastructure for citizen assembly um, complements to the Article Five process. Yeah, and uh, what form would this agreement take? Would this uh, be something that is passed by the 13 legislatures, or would it be uh, would it be a common text? Yeah, it should be common text. It's not a it's not a compact in the um, in the sense of the Constitution speaks of it. It's it's basically each state expressing its attitude about constitutional amendment, um, and it's not clear legally what its status would be, but it's pretty clear politically what its status would be um, because. If you had 13 states that had rejected it up front, an amendment up front or the convention up front, it would um, increase the resistance to the convention movement um, or increase the desire to fix the convention so it's not subject to that preemptive uh, rejection. Can you provide sort of a, a rough text that uh, might be used as a common template? Yeah, I mean, I, I have one. I don't have it here, but I have one. Okay. Which, but um, very roughly, maybe you can. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's in the form of what I described. Yeah. All the legislature would have to do is we, the legislature of Pennsylvania, exercising the power vested in us by Article 5 of the Constitution, do hereby preemptively reject any amendment that's proposed by an Article 5 convention, in my view, that doesn't, in the way that I've described it doesn't satisfy uh, democratic accountability constraint. Um, and that's all it would take. And uh, nothing further on democratic accountability or would that be spelled out? I don't think of the, the um, I don't think that it has to be precisely spelled out in the um, resolution. 
Um, but I think in the context of proposing the resolution, the examples that would be offered for defending the resolution would fill out the details of what it could look like. Um, and indeed, if like a mo moving state, like the state of Massachusetts moved it and then had a citizen assembly as their example of democratic accountability, that would begin to set a template that I think others could look to as well. The reason I'm not so focused on the pre precision there is I'm not sure exactly what the unit for democratic accountability needs to be. Um, you could easily imagine it's just as good to have, for example, have you know five regional uh, um, citizen assemblies. Uh, and you could imagine you know areas from a certain uh, states in a certain area like binding themselves to the consequences of that regional uh, assembly. That, you know I think the it's not clear to me exactly what the right um, contours are, but it um, but it would be something that would require, a link to a democratic a process of democratic accountability to turn the American constitutional amending process into one that has democratic uh, uh, accountability, um, like most other modern constitutions do. But I would think it's better than most other modern constitutions, because rather than a kind of final ratification accountability, it's like including informed and deliberated views of the public in the process of proposing the amendments which I think is actually um, much more important because obviously if, if the public is not present in the proposing of the amendments, many of the ideas of reform can be just thrown off the table by powerful existing interests. So you're not gonna have money in politics proposed by legislators um, who are deeply committed to the existing system for funding campaigns. But if you had a citizen assembly that could review it, then the citizen assembly would be much less committed to uh, the views about um, of the incumbent powerful interest. I think, uh, Matteo, do you have a question? Uh, yes, more like a question. So thank you for your presentation. And it's more like a question of understanding. Um, a convention itself, um, could, or could the convention itself already be like a citizen assembly or citizen jury or what, what is the form that well, the founding fathers were thinking of when they were putting a convention into the constitution? Yeah, so um, we don't have an example of a federal convention except for the convention that gave us our constitution. But we do have hundreds of examples of conventions at the state constitutional level, including in Massachusetts at the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, there was a very important convention that uh, amended the, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Constitution. And those look like um, uh, sui generis legislative bodies. I mean, they're elected representatives to those conventions. And um, in the Massachusetts case, if you read the proceedings, they're very high-minded. I mean, they, they're very talented people who are talking about complicated issues in ways that I can't imagine any of our current representatives being able to engage. Um, that's the tradition. And I would, of course, love the idea of imagining an Article 5 convention that itself was a citizen assembly. And there's nothing to stop it from being that. Congress could convene an Article 5 convention however it thought it should be convened. Um, well, that's actually an argument. There's an argument about whether the states control it or whether Congress does, and I don't think we have clear resolution. Either way, it could be convened like that. Um, my own in intuition here, though, is that it's important to take these steps slowly um, I think people who are close to uh, citizen assemblies are quite convinced about their democratic, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, that they are democratic uh, institutions that we should celebrate um, and, uh, and, and we should be pushing. I think most people who are not close to it begin with some skepticism. Um, and so I think structuring it so that they don't actually have a, a, a directly determinative role um, on, on you know, the precise language of an amendment or whatever um, would be an easier way to get buy-in to the idea of a convention, uh, per, uh, uh, of a citizen assembly participating in a convention. And you know, my hope is that we evolve to a place where it's obvious that critically important issues be handed to properly constituted citizen assemblies, at least for advising and consulting purposes. But I don't think we're there, at least in the United States yet. So what still worries me a bit is uh, the vagueness in the uh, 
proposition that the 13 would put forward. And what worries me about it is if this is not precise, then there will be quite a lot of pressure once the convention convenes and produces some products to say, well, the convention has spoken and we should really uh, accept it as legitimate, right? It seems to me that, or there could be disagreement among the 13, for example, yeah, whether the criterion was met or was not met. And then there could be a lot of pressure saying, look, we had a convention and yeah, no convention is exactly the way uh, you might have imagined it and you might have wanted it to be, but procedurally uh, it was good enough. Yeah, and and I agree it would be great to have precisely specified and enforceable constraints. Mm -hmm. The reality is there's no institution that could enforce those constraints. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, the most I think we can do is create a political constraint. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because even the idea of the 13 sign, you know, uh, asserting they preemptively reject doesn't write that in stone. You know, one of the 13 could change its mind and then pass a ratification of the amendment. Um, so uh, it turns out that ratifications um, uh, of an amendment stick, but rejections don't. Um, so, uh, uh, so this is just the political reality of the way uh, ratification happens. And, uh, and so the most you can do is just create the political pressure. And I think the political pressure is valuable on its own because it, it, it would be reinforced by a sense, I think in the public, that there ought to be some democratic participation in this process. Um, yeah. uh, because I think most people are deeply skeptical of the political class. Um, and so um, I, the only question is whether we could stand up institutions that earned their confidence quickly enough to uh, compete with their skepticism of the uh, political class. Yeah, so I agree completely with what you say about enforceability, but it seems to me that precision is a different dimension of this problem. And if precision is lacking, right, the thing is not enforceable for sure. But in order to be able to appeal after the Constitutional Convention is convened and has produced content, then to appeal and to say, look, we committed ourselves beforehand and uh, to reject preemptively uh, certain, you know, on procedural grounds, uh, the products of this convention, if it isn't very precisely stated what we committed ourselves be, to beforehand, yeah, that's going to come under political pressure. If that is made quite precise, of course, not enforceable, and this will have no legal force, mm -hmm. but it will have a kind of political force to say, look, we we warned these guys. We said in advance we were not going to accept anything that doesn't meet certain procedural requirements. And all we are doing now is uh, is basically living up to our pre-commitment. Yeah, I agree with you, Thomas. I, I that that's work to be done. It 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 certainly could be made precise, um, and uh, and that it should be. That's right. And that would give you the additional task of getting an agreement among the 13 exactly what precision should be. Mm -hmm. But I think that's essential. It, it's extra work, but it's essential because otherwise the coalition of the 13 is uh, is likely or possibly could, could disintegrate under pressure. Yep. Yep, yep I agree. Yeah. I have a more general question. Um, most Americans tend to believe that amending the Constitution is impossible. I'd say the most agency like the common person feels over the Constitution is like the ability to change it through legal interpretations, um, through judicial activism, not the actual amendment process. Um, I strongly believe that this is an entrenched attitude. It's one that's held by younger people in my generation um, and those in the generation above me. So how would you respond to people that believe that amending the constitution is impossible? I, I completely agree with uh, um, the read. Uh, and indeed, um, in one conversation with one of the strongest opponents to the Article 5 convention process, uh, the, the response was, look, why should we risk any of this? We can just, you know, this was in 2016, 
Hillary Clinton will be elected and we'll appoint three Supreme Court justices and we'll get everything we want through the court, um, which is, I think, both in the short term turned out not to be a sensible strategy, but in the long term is a really destructive strategy, because to the extent you rely exclusively on elite lawyers to express the values of your constitution, your constitution has no connection to the democratic process. Um, I think the most you can do is to begin to begin a process that demonstrates people participating in a progressive step towards getting an amendment. Um, so, you know, American Promise has been really effective in rallying people in the states to either support legislative resolutions favoring the amendment they're pushing or uh, state um, um, uh, um, initiatives to support the, uh, 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 the proposal they're pushing. And I think they've felt um, the energy grow as they've had those successes. What I'm concerned about is, of course, there's nothing from uh, the state saying we want Congress to do something that leads to Congress doing that thing. There's no, you know, if 50 states passed resolutions that say we want Congress to propose an amendment, it doesn't mean that anything would happen in Congress of necessity. There's no legal force to that and Congress would still have freedom. And what I'm worried about is all the energy leading to just being blocked by Congress um, would, of course, reinforce the sense that there's nothing that can be done about the Constitution. So I, I'm keen to begin to see processes that uh, inspire the imagination of people and their connection to the Constitution. I imagine if we could get the support to launch a whole bunch of these assemblies, they could begin their work long before we even got the legislatures to do their work, like just begin to deliberate on these amendments. What would come out of those processes, you know, as someone who's watched assemblies um, pretty closely, would strike people as so much more reasonable and reflective of the public's views than anything that comes out of state legislatures. I mean, you know, if you if you just systematically look at what does the you know seventy percent of America want on a wide range of issues, even when we're talking about just idiot polls, those views are wildly more sensible than the actual actions of Congress or state legislatures. Um, I think a citizen assembly would up the um, integrity of those views in the sense of like they'd be informed and um, the product of real deliberation. And that process, I think, would actually be exercising muscles that would heal our democratic weakness. I mean, I think one of the most important things we need to find is exercises um, for all of us to make us understand the potential of democracy again beyond elections. I mean, elections have turned out to be extremely polarizing and destructive. Um, and especially when you elect people and they can't get anything done. Um, and that, that just reinforces the sense. We did, I was just talking to a colleague today who was reporting a poll that found 30% of African-American youth, 30%, um, do not believe politics is a way to bring about change, meaning don't believe they should even be voting. Um, uh, and I understand why one could believe that because you get these big victories and still nothing significant happens, um, or at least nothing is characterized as significant that's happened. Um, and so I think we just need to start building things that actually give people hope that something could happen through uh, things that appear and feel like real democratic action. So one of the proposed constitutional amendments that you mentioned, um, like you said, was American Promises for Our Freedom Amendment. Uh, do you think that an Article 5 convention is the best way to take a major step towards solving the distorting and corrupting effects of money in politics? Or are there other ways that we can go about addressing this that would not require us to overturn a handful of Supreme Court decisions, including Buckley, Citizens United, Speech Now, McCutcheon, ATP v. Volokh, and more? Well, as you know, because we've talked a lot about this and you've done extraordinary research uh, in this area, um, I, I, my own view is that we could eliminate super PACs, that the Supreme Court will eliminate super PACs because it has never constitutionalized super PACs and super PACs are the most poisonous um, polarizing money in politics today. Um, you know, the Citizens United speech, meaning speech by corporations, 
um, is tiny. It's not even aggregated. It's like literally less than 20 million since Citizens United. Um, it's the super PAC money, meaning money that's put into committees that then spend their money independently of campaigns. And that money, um, if you take all of the itemized contributions since the beginning of super PACs, 70% of those contributions come from contributors who give a million dollars or more. 90% come from contributors who give $100,000 or more. So these are highly motivated, typically politically extreme um, interventions that dramatically constrain what legislatures could do. And the Supreme Court has never reviewed whether that is constitutionally mandated. Um, and the lower court decision speech now that did uh, rests on what strikes me and many to be a, a pretty obvious mistake. So if you eliminated super PACs, um, I think there's a question about what would the right um, uh, democratic commitment for reform then be? Because, you know, if you eliminated super PACs and passed uh, the For the People Act, um, which had a really uh, uh, incredibly important change to the way campaigns were funded, ended partisan gerrymandering of Congress, um, had a strong support for voting rights from the um, John Lewis uh, uh, Freedom to Vote Act, a um, whole bunch of ethics reforms, a bill which, you know, literally came within two votes in the Senate of passing. Um, you know, I would think it would be really incredibly important to pass that next, right? That would be the next really important thing we could accomplish without a constitutional amendment. But what I love in what American Promise is doing is it's a process for bringing Americans into a process for reflecting on the commitment to democracy. And I think th their amendment or amendment similar to that could have the consequence of really entrenching something our constitution does not entrench, which is a freedom to vote. There's no right to vote in our constitution. And so all of these restrictions can be upheld uh, in ways which they couldn't be upheld if it were in fact an affirmatively declared freedom to vote. Um, and uh, reinforce the ability to limit money and the effect on, uh, on, on, on that uh, freedom to vote. And I think you would have um, a critical uh, body of reform accomplished. Thank you. I don't wanna eat up the time. So does anyone else in the audience have any more questions? I would love to eat up a little more time if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, when you put yourself imaginatively into such a citizen assembly and uh, think about what you might propose uh, that for deliberation by citizens about uh, the outcome of a constitutional convention, uh, you know, what should be debated there and what should be pushed for there. Uh, and then think about the procedural questions that Maya just raised. You know, uh, obviously you've already said uh, the, the right to vote would be something that you think should be pushed forward. Uh, what about the process of amending the constitution? Uh, you said, I think that there is only so much a constitutional convention could actually do. It couldn't be change the three quarter requirement with regard to the states. Uh, what could a constitutional convention conceivably do? And what would you actually support? Yeah, so that's an important um, quibble to focus on this question of what it could do. Because, you know, remember in that video, Bob Reich right. asserted that the convention could change the rules for adopting an amendment. Mm -hmm. And the precedent that he's pointing to is the original convention that gave us our constitution. Because the constitution was written against the background of the Articles of Confederation, which expressly said the only way to amend the Articles of Confederation would be if every state legislature voted unanimously to amend those articles. And the uh, convention um, in Philadelphia thought that was not feasible. So they recommended an amend uh, a ratification process that only had nine state conventions, not nine state legislatures, needed to ratify to make the convention make the constitution valid. It's and critics of the, yeah. yeah, and the critics of that con of the convention point to that to say, see, they did it in 1787. They could do it today. Um, 
but the but the sloppiness in that thinking I think is really important to 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 point out right because what happened in 1787 was not that the convention changed anything it was that the convention recommended to Congress that Congress changed the mode by which amendments could be adopted. Okay, so imagine the parallel today. Imagine a convention said, we wanna abolish the second amendment, but we know that would never pass by three quarters of the states. So we're gonna say, have a national referendum. And if a majority of the referendum say the second amendment is abolished, the second amendment is abolished. So they propose that and it goes to Congress and imagine Congress says, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's say that if we're going to have a referendum and if a majority support it, then the Second Amendment is abolished. Well, nobody who has any sense about American, modern American constitutional law would doubt that immediately the Supreme Court would find a way to step in and say, hey, wait a minute. The express terms of the Constitution say that a convention only has the power to propose amendments. It doesn't have the power to change the procedure by which amendments can be adopted. And certainly Congress without amending the constitution, has no power to change the procedure by which an amendment could be adopted. So it would certainly stop any such change. And then you could say, well, why didn't that happen in 1787? And the answer is there was no Supreme Court with judicial review over anything Congress did. So there is no, uh, there's no chance in the current context to imagine them changing it, except through a, an amendment process. Now, I think the amendment process should address how the Constitution gets amended. And I would hope it would entrench a citizen assembly like provision in the process of amending the Constitution, something like Mongolia. Like you can't propose an amendment until it's been passed through um, a deliberative poll. Jim Fishkin asked deliberative poll of Americans, maybe five of them. Uh, and at least let us see what the public thinks about this before you take up that amendment. That would be a great modification, and I, I would certainly support that. On democracy rights more generally, I think the critical changes are, number one, recognizing a fundamental entitlement to vote of all, um, uh, of all Americans, um, um, obviously constrained by age, at least. Number, that's number one. Number two, um, a commitment to funding campaigns that uh, assures that uh, the tiny fraction of the 1% can't leverage power over the funding to leverage power over government. So I would support, you know, constitutionalizing a process of public funding, I would certainly support the ability to limit um, uh, contributions um, to political action committees, both directly and indirectly. Um, and number three, I think, uh, uh, a fundamental commitment to end um, uh, gerrymandering in the in the process of the states uh, in the process of selecting districts in the states, um, and and I think those changes you know could easily be folded within a single amendment process, um, and if we did that, then I think we would address a huge democratic deficit inside the United States right now. Mm -hmm. You've brought up um, super PACs or independent expenditure only PACs quite a number of times, uh, and I, I'm curious. Do you think that popular sovereignty can exist in a democracy where super PACs are as present as they are right now in the United States? Yeah, not for long, not for long, because um, the distorting effect here is really um, uh, profound. Um, you know, Boss Tweed, who was the um, famous uh, party boss in uh, Tammany Hall in the 19th century in America, used to say, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. And that's a pretty genius political insight. If you get to pick who the candidates are, you pretty much control what the results are. And that's the same logic that existed in the South when they had the white primary. You know, Texas, for example, famously had Democratic primary, was the Democratic Party was the only party that mattered. To vote in the Democratic primary, you had to be white. Um, you know, this is long after uh, the 15th Amendment um, for lots of complicated reasons. You had to be white. Um, in the general election, anybody could vote, but it didn't matter in the general election because you'd already picked um, the only candidate who could win, the Democratic nominee, and the whites had had that view. So the whites basically did the nominating, um, even though all people, including African Americans, were free to do the electing. Um, those two examples, I think, like point out the deep corruption that um, the super PACs affect, because it's not even when they spend their money. There's a great paper called the iceberg effect. Um, 
campaign finance, where it basically says, look, it's not so much what it, what money you see is spent, it's what money is credibly threatened. Um, so the iceberg underneath the water, so that you know the threat can be you know multiples of the actual amount that's spent. As long as you're credible that you're going to spend the money against somebody, you stop them from doing what you don't want them to do. Um, I once saw um, Evan Bai describe the, what he feared the most about, um, but what he said everybody in Capitol Hill feared the most about super PACs, which is a week before an election, a super PAC would drop a million dollars against you. Um, and so what you needed to do was basically assure that there would be a million dollars spent for you if somebody attacked you. Um, so you needed to, in effect, buy super PAC insurance. Um, and how do you buy insurance? Well, you pay your premiums in advance. And how do you pay your premiums? Well, you align yourself with uh, a super PAC that's likely to like you, and you behave in a way that makes it so the super PAC will defend you. So without a single dollar spent, you have Congress people who are conforming their behavior to the rules set by these super PACs so that they can rely on them if in fact it turns out they need them in the context of an election. Well, that is such a deeply corrupting influence inside of the politics. Um, and I don't think if you, I think you, you must get rid of that if you're gonna get a politics that convinces people it's democratically responsible. Now, one of the most striking and terrifying to me facts about where we are today is to recognize, you know, Citizens United was decided in January 2010. Speech Now was decided by the DC Circuit in March 2010. So, you know, we've had 13 years of super PAC culture. And basically everybody who is running organizations doing political work or rallying uh, behind causes to get political work done has grown up with super PACs. Nobody can even remember the days when uh, there was something other than super PACs at the center of political life. So we're in the process of trying to stand up a initiative in Maine to tee up the question of whether super PACs are constitutionally required. Um, and, uh, and though the public overwhelmingly supports it, our polling found 78% of Mainers support uh, eliminating super PACs. Um, and that's just as many Republicans as Democrats. It's not a partisan issue. The actual political organizations, including nonprofit organizations, are highly skeptical because they can't quite think how they would do their work if they couldn't call up three or four billionaires <laughs> to get them to fund their campaigns. Um, and so you see this weakening of uh, recognition of why this is a corrupting system uh, at the core of those who are actually engaging in politics. And then to compound that problem, the billionaires themselves who a decade ago were committed to eliminating super PACs, and I know this because I raised $15 million from them, um, increasingly like super PACs. Increasingly, you talk to them and they're like, yeah, this is kind of a convenient and efficient way for me to push. And then they talk about some principle of justice that they want to push. And I'm no doubt believe there are people who are spending super PAC money to do things I would consider good. I just also have no doubt that it's deeply destructive of the democratic process that they are doing that regardless of what the results in the end are. And I would make the argument that on balance, it's not gonna be progressive results that come from this because the most incentivized spenders of money are people like the Koch brothers. Um, so, you know, you have all these people who believe we're gonna get fundamental reform on climate if we just work hard enough. Um, but forget that, you know, before 2010, there were Republicans who really believed climate change was real and they had real solutions to the problem. John McCain genuinely thought he had a better program for addressing climate change than Barack Obama did. In 2010, the Koch brothers made it known that any Republican who even acknowledged the truth of climate change would be primaried, meaning they would spend money in the primary to take them out. And almost overnight, the number of Republicans willing to even acknowledge the truth of climate change just, uh, went from not majority, but significant number to zero. Uh, now that was the threat value of uh, the Koch brothers. They didn't have to actually primary anybody or they primary two or three. They just had to demonstrate they would and everybody cower, you know, ran away from that position. Um, and so, you know, here, from my view, one of the most 
important existential threats to us as people um, can't be addressed because of this distorting, corrupting effect of money. And if, if we can't even rally people to recognize why this is a problem, then I'm really fearful about um, what our democracy is going to look like. How would you respond to someone, uh, say Floyd Abrams, who believes that a constitutional amendment, um, supposedly that would get rid of super PACs, uh, would be a massive violation of political speech, for example? How, how do you respond to the free speech argument? So this is not my first uh, best solution, but I'm perfectly happy saying Citizens United can stand. Buckley versus Vallejo can stand. People are free to spend their own money. Um, if you want to be a corporation spending money opposing climate change, then have at it. Um, the corruption is the committees that get to aggregate and coordinate um, and then use their voice to, um, to affect political results. So the super PACs, again, are orders of magnitude more significant than just corporations spending their money on their own. Um, and so I would be happy to say we're not restricting anybody's speech. Let them say what they want. What we're saying is that we're limiting the contributions to a committee um, because we can see the corrupting dynamic that produces both the direct quid pro quo corruption um, and indirect, the kind of dependency corruption. So, you know, when speech now was decided, the logical error that the DC circuit made was to assume that if the speech was independent, as a matter of law, which means as a matter of logic, contributions to the committee that make the speech must be independent. And that's possible, it could be independent, like if you've got a committee spending money against climate change and some rich uh, oil tycoon says, I wanna help you spend money against climate change, that contribution to that committee is completely independent of any political candidate, so there's no possible quid pro quo with a political candidate. But my favorite senator, Robert Menendez from New Jersey, demonstrated that this possibility is not a logical necessity because what Menendez was charged with in 2015, it wasn't, he wasn't convicted by the jury because they didn't think he had the, they had the evidence, but what he was charged with is engaging in a, a deal with a Florida man, quid pro quo, where he would give the Florida man favors in exchange for the Florida man giving Menendez's super PAC money so there was a plain example of quid pro quo corruption involving a contribution to a super PAC, the sort of thing that the DC circuit said was not possible. Indeed, the lawyers for Menendez actually made an argument that said that speech now shows that Menendez must be innocent because what Menendez was charged with, speech now said was not possible. And the judge said, that's just crazy talk. We can see it's possible. That's what's alleged here. So. This, this logical error at the core of, spe of speech now has been noted, but nobody's yet gotten it up to the Supreme Court to give this court a chance to correct it. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're just getting into the good stuff. I'm so upset that we have two minutes remaining. Um, but with that, I just wanna thank uh, Mr. Lessig for making the time to attend the virtual Global Justice Conference. Um, we have one session left. Uh, Thomas, I, I don't know who's leading it, um, but we should probably turn it over to them now. So Thank you very much. Yes. Sujata is leaving it. And many, many thanks, Larry, for coming Thank one you. more time and enlightening us. It was a wonderful session, very, very enlightening. And we got to a lot of the important issues here. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me.